Are you sure that'll be all, sir? Oh, uh, yes, thank you, Gilpin. I shan't want anything more. Oh, uh, by the way, how's your wife? Is she recovering from the operation? Well, I'm happy to say there's progress, but it will be a long job, sir. Yes, uh, well, um... Yeah. Buy her something with this. Cheer her up. Oh, thank you, sir. You're most kind. I do appreciate it. Oh, that's all right. I hope things go well for you. Good night, Gilpin. Good night, sir. No use putting it off any longer. Present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. A matter of conscience. James Berryford's death by his own hand shocked the London business world. The rumours had been well founded. Never smoke without fire, the financiers said over their whiskies and sodas. Berryford's notes had been going about the city at 40% discount, and there were no takers. Settling day was the very next day. He realised he was a completely ruined man, and so he took the only way out. James Beresford, the man who shot himself yesterday... He at least did not leave a wife and family. Oh, uh, no. No, quite. Uh, poor devil. I know the man was a gambler and probably wrecked a great deal of havoc through his ruthlessness in business, but I can't help feeling sorry for him. He, he must have been in a desperate state of mind. Mm, indeed, yes. I met the gentleman on more than one occasion through my brother Mycroft in the Diogenes Club. He was on the surface a most amiable and fair-minded man. He was well-liked by many and feared by most. A man like Beresford makes many enemies in the course of a lifetime. Well, you mean that, that his enemies may have brought about his ruin? Oh, undoubtedly. The point is that in order to outmaneuver his kind, one has to be within the inner circle, as it were. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I follow that, Holmes. Well, I mean, only someone near to him, someone who held his confidence, would be able to trick him so cleverly that it would lead to total bankruptcy. But you think he was... Driven to this by the treachery of his friends. Oh, almost certainly. That may appear cynical of me, and I doubt if we shall ever learn the truth, but I should judge it to be so. How dreadful that any man can be betrayed to that extent. Mm, quite. It is inhuman and immoral. But not a criminal matter, for no one has broken any laws. One can cheat a man quite legally by giving him false advice. If I sway your judgment to back a horse that has no chance of winning, well, whose fault is that? Yes, well, I see what you mean. But if Beresford was forced to kill himself by someone else, I wouldn't like to have that person's conscience. Ah, yes, a matter of conscience. Yes, that is a different matter. Ah, we have a visitor. I wonder who that can be so early on a cold November's morning. Now, if, if it's anybody important, you have no need to fear of my presence. I, I've ne sadly neglected my patients due to this flu epidemic, and I, I must be about my business. Oh, no, 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 please don't go. I value your opinions. They give me the slant of the ordinary man in the street. Oh, excuse me, a young lady to see you, Mr. Holmes, refuses to give her name, and apparently she ain't got no car. Mm. Well, her business must be urgent to ignore the weather and the social niceties. Uh, show her in, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, very well. This way, please. Thank you. Uh, do come in. May I introduce myself? I am Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I know who you are. I have often seen you, Mr. Holmes. Do come nearer the fire. Uh, take a seat. Uh, some coffee? Uh, no, thank you. I cannot stop. Uh, and you will possibly ask me to leave anyway. You see... I want some advice, but I'm not prepared to give you my name or address. That is at least honest. You could have lied about those facts and hoped to get away with it. I, I don't lie. I always tell the truth. I want you to advise me on the correct course of punishing a man who has forced another man to commit suicide. Ah, 
This is a most curious request. Something which is both pertinent and topical. I take it that you're referring to the death of Mr. James Beresford. How did you guess that? It's really not at all hard. The case is splashed all over the newspapers. Watson and I are discussing the tragedy and the poor fellow's state of mind just before you called. Suicide while the balance of his mind was disturbed. That what you think? Nonsense. He was driven to it by Max Corbett. Max Corbett. Yes, they started as partners. Is that not so? Very many years ago. An enterprise known as International Supplies. Very ambitious and very successful. It was all James Beresford's skill and business acumen. But Corbett and his cronies got to know more. They deceived him in, in various different ways under different names. Beresford trusted them. He was unaware, even up to the last six months, of the bitterness and hatred he was faced with. Can you believe it? Oh, yes. Uh, please continue. You're telling me very little that I didn't know. Beresford was forced in the end to turn to moneylenders, only to find that they also were puppets of Max Corbett's men. Then came the final squeeze. It, it was cold-blooded and calculated, and at the moment these men are pretending to be heartbroken, but they are inwardly delighted. They should be punished. They must be punished. Particularly Max Corbett. Do you not agree with me, Mr. Holmes? <laughs> My dear young lady, as I pointed out to Watson only a short while ago, this cannot be regarded as a criminal matter. Everything you say may be true. You may even be able to produce certain facts as proof, but there is no way that you're going to pin a crime onto Max Corbett. If you start to spread these rumors, you can lay yourself open to an action for slander. But Corbett is too clever to be caught like that. You mean that, that my hands are tied? That there is nothing I or anyone else can do? Mm, I didn't say that. I shall have to give the matter some thought. I wonder... Uh, Watson, while you're doing your rounds, will you be anywhere within the vicinity of the Diogenes Club? I can be, Holmes, yes. Then would you be good enough to deliver a note to my brother Mycroft? He's bound to be there around lunchtime. Excuse me a moment. Paper and pen. Envelope. Yes. Mr. Holmes, it is quite clear that my worst fears have been confirmed. I'm doing no good here. Merely wasting your time. I'd better leave. Yeah, no, 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 no. Please don't go. There you are, Watson. Now, if you could see that this is delivered as soon as possible. Oh, very well. I shall do my best. Oh, uh, will you excuse me now? I'm a doctor and have to attend to patients. I shall call back later, Holmes. Uh, good morning to you. And now, young lady, answer me one thing. If I agree to help you, you will give me your name and address here and now. I got to the Diogenes Club just before lunch and left Holmes's note for his brother. The place seemed unusually crowded. I met a few people I knew who invited me for a drink. And it being a cold day, I accepted gratefully. It was while in one of the rooms that I heard the name Max Corbett mentioned. Ah, Max. Max Corbett. <laughs> Might have known that you'd be here today. Toasting to success. I don't know what you mean, Wilder. I came to collect some mail. And now I'm off to see my fiancée. That's worth a toast. Ah, yes, the Honourable Abigail Stratton. Yes, I read of your engagement. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. But today is not a happy one. Not after hearing of poor Beresford shooting himself. <laughs> poor Beresford, indeed. Cut out the rot, Max. I happen to have been on the right side when international supplies went under, so I'm not complaining. But I'm not a fool. You and I and the rest of the crowd caused it to happen. That's a lie. It's true, and you know it. You put Beresford out of the game as surely as if you pulled the trigger of that revolver yourself. You played every dirty trick you could to beat him. I've got to hand it to you. You got what you wanted. Mind you, what Abigail Stratton would think. Well, lucky for you, she doesn't understand business deals. Now, you keep Abigail out of this. Oh, it doesn't matter to me. She's your problem. I wonder how you'll explain it all. Tell me something, Max. Were you... Very afraid of him. Afraid of him? Afraid of Beresford? No, of course not. Not in the slightest. Well, I'd say you were scared stiff. That's why you couldn't fight straight. You've made a fortune out of him, but you had to do it crookedly. James Beresford was a gambler, but a fair one. Something you'll never be, a fair fighter. Now, that's enough, Wilder. I'm not staying here to listen to this. And you'd better watch your step. You're right when you say I have influence now, more than I've ever had. So be careful. <laughs> you can't frighten me, Max. I've taken all precautions. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Corbett. Uh, you called for your mail, but uh, this one must have been overlooked. It was at the desk. Uh, 
Uh, how he got there, I can't say. Must have just arrived uh, by hand. Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, excuse me, Walter. What? Well, that's strange. The handwriting, it, it looks like... Well, go on. Open it up, then, old boy. It might be important. We can't end it like this. You cannot get rid of me. I shall always be near. I will call upon you at your home in Eaton Square next Thursday evening, exactly at nine o'clock. You will see me. You cannot avoid it. Jimmy. Oh, what the devil? What's up, Max? You look as though you've seen a ghost. Not bad news, I hope. Something frightened you. Again? What is it this time? Something real or something imaginary? Or is it the fact that you have a guilty conscience? The next few days were very busy ones for me. I was either out in the cold, misty London streets visiting sick patients or attending to them in my surgery. I hardly saw Holmes. And when I did, he was usually coming in or going out of 221B Baker Street, so muffled up that I could scarcely recognize him. Then, about two days after the inquest on the death of James Beresford, we had a caller. The morning was a foggy one. Gas lamps burned in the streets long after daylight. It was surprisingly cold, and Mrs. Hudson arrived later than usual. She was not pleased to receive a visitor in these circumstances. Oh, now, what on earth? Oh, it's going to be one of those days. Yes? I want to see Sherlock Holmes, Martin. I'm not so sure that you can. Have you an appointment? No, but it's early. He must be at home. That is, if he isn't still in bed. Mr. Holmes is always up early. But he doesn't like to be disturbed at this hour. Now, if you give me... No, look here. Yeah, that's enough. Let me in. I didn't come all this way to argue with a common washerwoman on a doorstep. Common oh, washerwoman, indeed. The rooms are upstairs. Very well, I'll find my own way. You can't charge him like this, sir. He wants to know who you are and what your business is. It's my job to look after him and see that he isn't put upon by the likes of people like you. Come here, quiet. Um, yes, what is it? This, this man pushed his way in, sir, and he demands to see you. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I couldn't keep it out. But that's all right. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. You may come back to clear breakfast in ten minutes. Uh, oh, come on, what a woman indeed. <laughs> come in, Mr. Corbett. Take a seat. Uh, you know Dr. Watson? How do you do? No, I don't know Watson, but I'm glad to see you remember me, Holmes. We've met a couple of times at the club, haven't we? That is correct. May I ask the purpose of this surprise visit? Oh, it's all right. You may speak freely in front of my friend. I have no secrets from him. Well? I'm being persecuted. And I want you to put a stop to it. Persecuted? You mean someone is threatening you? You're in bodily danger in some way? A threat to your well-being? <laughs> then why not go to the police? Oh, no, no, no. No, there's nothing tangible for the police to get their teeth into. It's far too subtle. And the fact is that... Since my good friend and ex-partner James Beresford killed himself, uh, someone has been uh, well, persecuting me. I I've received a note. Here, I'll, uh, I'll show it to you. It was delivered at the club. It's a, a stupid joke, of course, someone with a perverted sense of humor. It's written, as you can see, as though it came from Jimmy Beresford. The, the, the handwriting is the same. My dear Corbett, if you know this is just a malicious trick, then why not burn it and forget the whole matter? Because it won't stop there. It hasn't. I'm, I'm being watched. Followed. I, I, I know I am. And I've seen him. Not once or twice, but several times. Seen him? Seen whom? Well, someone. Disguised as, as Jimmy. Okay, coming out of the fog. Why, only yesterday I... I banged into him. I, I could have sworn it actually was him. Tall, big, dressed in the way that Jimmy always dressed. Even the same cigars, the, the, the smell. The, the, the fact is that someone's trying to scare me. Break my concentration. If that was the objective, it certainly succeeded. You seem very distrait. Well, it's getting on my nerves. Well, of course it is. I, I'm too busy a man to be bothered by such petty things. I, I'm going to get married soon. I don't... This going on a moment longer. You've got to stop it, Holmes. I fail to see quite what I can do. Well, catch whoever it is behind all this. I, I'll pay you any amount of money you want. Now, now, look, today is Tuesday. And in that 
blasted note. It says that, that whoever it is, is is going to call on me at nine o'clock on Thursday. Well? Well, here's your chance. You've got two days. Now, catch whoever it is that's tormenting me. Arrest him. Hunt him out. Scare the living daylights out of him. Warn him that, that if this persecution continues, he'll be dealt with. I, I, I don't quite know what methods you can use. I, I don't care. Just, just tell me how much you want to offer me complete protection. Mr. Corbett, I'm a private detective. I only deal in very important criminal matters. I am not a bodyguard. And cases like this are of no interest to me whatsoever. You, you mean you won't take the case? <coughs> may I clear now, sir? I do not consider that there is a case, Corbett. Uh, yes, Mrs. Hudson, you may take away the breakfast things and see this gentleman to his carriage. Don't be well. But you'll be sorry for all this. And I don't need that creature to show me out. Goodbye. We've had some ill-mannered people in these here rooms, Mr. Holmes, but me, he must rate us the worst chick. No we reach. That's what the French should call him. I am inclined to agree, but forget it, Mrs. Holmes. But he called me a common washerwoman and a creature. It really doesn't matter. That's all very well. But people in glass houses shouldn't try to put the straw that break the camel's back through the eye of a needle. A plethora of mixed metaphors, Mrs. Hudson, but you made your point. After Max Corbett left, Holmes was strangely silent. He returned to his seat by the fire and relit his pipe. He knew far more than he'd told me and wasn't going to tell me more. I packed my things and prepared to leave on my daily rounds. As I put on my overcoat and gloves, he said, You will be free this evening, won't you, Watson? No, I have no appointments, but I doubt if I shall be home before seven. Oh, that's all right. Ample time to get over to Eaton Square by nine. Ah, where Corbett lives. Where to pay a call upon him. That's right. Although I'm quite sure he will have another unexpected visitor before then, but we must be ready for all emergencies. A young lady to see you, sir. Her card. Hmm? Oh, thank you. Miss Gillian Marsh, secretary to Mr. James Beresford. Hmm. Oh, what's the, what's the, uh, the time here? Hmm? Eight o'clock, Mr. Corbin. Oh, all right. Show him. Very good, sir. This way, please, miss. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Corbett. Good evening. I don't think we've met. I was Mr. Beresford's secretary. I have called because I wanted to know if you could help me. Have you any similar work for me to do? I'm very experienced in your type of business... And I'm now unemployed. I'd be grateful for some help. Well, sit down, Miss Marsh. This seems the most odd time for you to call. Hardly business hours. But let's not bother about that. You see, you worked for Jimmy Beresford. I never saw you in his office. I worked for him at his home. I was a private secretary. I see. Then you must know all his correspondence. Tell me, Miss Marsh, have you ever seen this note before? James Beresford's writing. She'll see you Eaton Square. Mm -hmm. Call on Tuesday evening. Exactly at nine. What? what? What's that? Tuesday evening? No, no, no. No, it says Thursday evening. Oh, no. No, you're mistaken. I know this writing. It's Tuesday. But, but th th that's today. I, I made all the preparations for Thursday. I I'm going to Paris that morning. It, it can't be Tuesday. It can't be. It, it, it's eight o'clock. And Jimmy will be here within the hour. I'll leave you to face him, Mr. Corbett. No, no, don't, don't go. Please, please, please don't. I, I, I have to think. You see, I, I, I've been having this, the strangest hallucinations. I, I, I've been seeing Beresford ever since he died. He, he, he's been standing on street corners at the club, getting out of carriages, just, 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 just standing there, haunting me. And, and, and now, now he's supposed to be coming here and within the hour. Are you sure that note says Tuesday? Of course. Look for yourself. <laughs> How odd. Of course, even the signature could be misinterpreted. Instead of Jimmy, it could be Jilly. Oh, I'd realized that before. Before? You, you mean you, you've seen this note before? Now, tell me. Tell me all about it. I pay you well. Anything, anything you, you can do to put my mind at rest. Just, just, just prove this is a stupid, malicious joke and, and set my mind at rest. Please, please, please help me. You really are frightened, aren't you? Frightened that the doorbell will ring and through that door will walk the ghost of James Beresford to torment your soul. Well, all right. I'll set your crooked little mind at rest. No one will be coming here. Ah, uh, how, how do you know? Because I wrote that note. I wrote it after he died. You see, I wasn't his secretary. I am his niece. Uncle Jimmy was one of the best. You had him hunted down and you were glad when he was killed. 
Well, I wanted to make you suffer as he must have suffered. I could imitate Uncle's handwriting. I did it because I, I wanted to see what kind of a man you were. I've proved it. You are a cheap coward. Oh, is that so? Indeed. Well, don't think that a chit of a girl like you is going to show me up. You think you've taught me a lesson? Well, I'll teach you now, here and now. I'll show you to start with. Oh, how dare you? How dare you? Stop! Just stop it! Oh, I'll just show me up, will you? You want to go fix it? here? How's this? That's enough, Corbett. Leave her alone. Watson, take care of him. Come on, Anna. Come on, Do You want me to deal with you? You all right, Miss Martha? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Maximilian! Just what does all this mean? Oh, Abigail! Well, how, how did you... T what, why are you here? I was asked by Mr. Sherlock Holmes to come here this evening. He said I would learn something to my advantage. I seem to have done so. I'm leaving. I have nothing to say to you now, and I shall have nothing to say to you in the future. But I can explain all this. I, I, I can explain. It, it's a trick. Perhaps, Miss Stratton, you would like to take this note. It will explain that what you have seen was premeditated. Max always plans everything, down to the last detail. Thank you. I'm grateful I found out the worst before it's too late. Good night, gentlemen. Goodbye, Maximilian. It wasn't until we were back at Baker Street that Holmes confessed his part in the unmasking of Max Corbett. He puffed at his pipe with satisfaction. You see, I agreed with Gillian Marsh. Something should be done to curb this man's ambitions. So I plotted with her to show up the weaker side of his nature. I even impersonated James Beresford. I'm quite good at disguises, you know, and could well remember how the man looked and walked. Then, when we had preyed upon his mind long enough, we brought things to a climax, making sure that his fiancée, Abigail Stratton, saw what kind of a man he really was. Now, rumours will spread after this. I shall think it will be many long days before he dares show his face at the Diogenes Club, for instance. Hardly a criminal case, I agree, but one where I think justice has been done. Don't you agree, Watson? Oh, Joe, yes, very clever, although perhaps not entirely ethical. <laughs> well, the man is defeated in a much more gracious manner than he has defeated many others. My conscience is quite clear. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson.